let's move on to our introductions. So Beth Ann Gehrman Merkel is based at the University of Wyoming. She's the director of the Wyoming Science Communication Initiative and the director of Research Impacts Assessment. Beth Ann is also a professor of practice in the Department of Zoology and Physiology. She co-founded the Communication Engagement Section of the Ecological Society of America. And Beth Ann is interested in the integration of drawing into education and communication. She's also interested in the role that stories play in shaping public perspectives of science and ecology topics. And Beth Ann explores mechanisms of effective training to enhance scientists' communication skills. Beth Ann is the co-host of the Meteor SciCom podcast. Um, so if you aren't just looking to improve science communication, but you want to make the world better through impactful science communication tools and communities, then check out Meteor. Um, the goal of the podcast is to give people a boost to do inclusive science communication with an impact. Mike San, San Clements is a soil scientist and biogeochemist. He is leading the terrestrial instrument science team at NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network. And he is an affiliate member of, um, faculty member of the University of Colorado Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research. So Mike is also part of our FE Partners Working Group. And his writing and photography, photography have appeared in a, a number of um, places, including the New York Times, Backpacker Magazine, Grist, Parade, and others. And his book, Plastic Purge, came out in 2014. And in that, Mike talks about the good, the bad, and the ugly about plastics and provides advice about how to use less plastics. And I would highly recommend both Beth Ann's podcast and Mike's books. They're really great. Okay, so let's stop that and get on with um, talking with Beth Ann and Mike. Um, so to get us started, um, can you both give us some more details about the different ways that you have communicated science outside academic publications and talk about how you got involved with um, drawing and storytelling in your podcast, Beth Ann, and for you, Mike, your science writing and photography? Sure. Who wants to go first? Beth Ann, do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? <clears throat> okay. I think you're pointing at me. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think for me, it started, well, in a couple of different ways. I've always been really fascinated by just um, journalism in general and writing. And if um, I think in college, if I hadn't found science kind of challenging and wanted to challenge myself, I would have actually been an English major or a journalism major. It's always sort of been my passion. I'm a, a, like a fierce book nerd. That is sort of my love. And um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, but I think where, where it really kicked off for me was um, when I was a postdoc and I was in Antarctica at Lake Frixel doing research and I had spent a couple of months in the field there and I and you know flying around in helicopters and we were we were looking at um, dissolved organic matter in all these glaciers and, and lakes down there and we were doing this this it was really a grand adventure right and this fascinating work and I was sitting in this little cardboard box doing lab work at Lake Frixel in Antarctica and I was waiting um, you know, for some DOM to drip through a column. And I was sitting there and I started writing up the methods section of um, the paper I the paper I was collecting data for. And I was thinking about like what the methods section of a scientific paper is and versus what actually transpired to collect these samples. And it's like literally the most boring distillation of something exciting you could possibly ever imagine come up with, right? And I love to cook too. And like even recipes usually have like an introduction about the history of the food or something if you're reading like the New York Times cooking app or something. Um, where the science papers tend to, you know, they're so dry. And so uh, I started to pull together some of the photos I had um, collected over, over the couple months in Antarctica with sort of a one minute long sort of like photo, you know, storytelling narrative. And I, and I submitted it to the New York Times and they ended up publishing it on their website. And basically that was sort of this thing. And it was like this, this sort of eye opening moment for me. We we're like, wow, like look at all the stuff that goes into making this happen, but look at all the stuff we leave out. And like, how can you tell the story of science by also including the fascinating parts and and keep people into like the results can still be part of it and why you're doing this but also there's so much that goes into it that we don't cover in our traditional meaning of communication so that was sort of the beginning for beginning of it for me and i sort of lucked out in that i got this first piece published and that sort of kicked me off into this this whole idea and then from there i um i continued down that pathway writing more about different parts of ecological science and Work I was going 
interested in. And then there is a um, part where Grist had a um, thing where they had said, Grist was like an online environmental newspaper. And it was kind of like cheeky and snarky, but it was really good at communicating science, I felt like, and communicating topics. And they had said, someone should, you know, submit a an idea to sort of bring awareness to a part and do a six part or seven part series blog on like bringing awareness to an environmental topic. And I suggested the idea of not creating any plastic waste for um, two weeks. And I was really naive about what that meant then. I figured like I would go to the grocery store and bring a bag and that was kind of the end of it. And so I started doing this experiment and I tried to go grocery shopping the first time and I was in the grocery store for like three hours and I couldn't buy anything. <laughs> it's like, you can't buy anything. Like this is insane. And so I, I ended up doing this whole, like this whole six part series blog for them about like what it, what it was like to not create any plastic waste for two weeks. And it blew my mind uh, and like, it really opened my eyes to this problem. And I, and I finished the blog and I kind of thought well, that would be the end of it. And what ended up happening was um, someone at St. Martin's press in New York had been reading my blog and reached out to me and was like, you should write a book on this topic. We really liked your voice. And so they're like, here's a literary agent. <laughs> and that's like, okay. So I worked with, um, with them to come up with a book proposal and submitted that. But that's really how I got started and really interested in the idea. And I think um, I didn't know what I was doing. And so everything I learned was sort of on the fly, right? And I, and I learned so much in writing this book and communicating these topics. And then even more in like having the book published and going and getting into speaking at schools and libraries and colleges and universities on this topic, being invited to talk about plastic and like, over the years, I've like really fine tuned for me, like how you convey science and how you keep it interesting. And so I think we can talk more about that, but I'll let Beth Ann go. Yeah. Awesome, Mike. So my beginnings in science and science communication are a little different. I, I'm trying to think about where to start. So I grew up as a kid with no real exposure to the outdoors, didn't we didn't camp, we didn't hike, we didn't any of that. Despite the fact that I grew up in a semi-rural, very small community in Montana, it, my family didn't have access to that stuff because they didn't have knowledge about it and we had no money. So we weren't, you know, we weren't able to pay for the cost to recreate in a lot of ways. And I look back on that now and it helps me understand why some folks don't have the same passion for the environment or scientific information that I might but where that really got me is that I still really loved science and art. And I wound up taking all the science and art and math classes that were available at my little high school. I got to college and realized I didn't know what I was doing there. I'm also a first gen kid. There's, there's nobody in my family who has a clue what I'm doing these days. I've been sort of like Mike said, improvising pretty much every day of my career because I don't have any close models except thanks thankfully for Twitter like Twitter is an incredible universe of people sharing wisdom and I went to school for environmental engineering thought that could be some kind of connection between stuff I was interested spent one year at an engineering school and was like they don't do music here there's no art the only literature was to meet some state accreditation requirement. I'm like, I don't know what I need, but this is not going to work. And I wound up transferring to this Montana State University and kind of by accident got into this program where we spent a year. It was a very small cohort. There were about 15 students. We took all of our classes together and it was basically a, a science and societies type of program called Wilderness and Civilization. And the whole thing started in my hometown on the Rocky Mountain front with a 10 day backpacking trip in the Bob Marshall wilderness, which is about a 40 minute drive from my parents' house where I grew up and I'd never been there. And I didn't know a thing about being in the world like that. And it was radical and transformative for me in so many ways. I grew up in a really conservative family, a huge in your business kind of family and just had never heard of basically every single thing we talked about that whole year. And it, it just massively overhauled what I knew to think about in the world. And I wound up 
changing my registrar official or changing my major officially with the registrar seven times in four and a half years of being an undergrad. And I was, now I can make it sound coherent, but what was actually happening is I was pinballing between things like engineering and wildlife biology and art education and food system studies and trying to find a way to put all these things that were blowing my mind together. And then I wound up spending about a decade in community nonprofit management work. I, I'm a kind of inveterate organizer. Give me a Tupperware cupboard or a spice cupboard or a policy or a procedure. And, and it's my, it's my happy zone. And I wound up running nonprofits and learning a lot from people about how to run educational programming around various types of conservation and environmental issues. And then my husband got a PhD offer in Quebec City and we moved and neither of us spoke French and it was a hard dunk in cold water up there and it was amazing. And I couldn't do the only things I really knew how to do. The two stipulations on my work permit were can't work with food and can't work with kids. And that was a huge part of what I had done. And so I I had to find a new way to do and think about the stuff that I was interested in. And I wound up kind of falling into Twitter and the blog sphere as people were really revving up talking about science writing and science editing and starting to share career information in those spaces. And I wound up becoming a freelance academic manuscript editor, and I became an associate editor at the English language newspaper in Quebec City with a really strong focus on science and the environment. Basically, the way I can describe myself in a couple words is that I'm an ecology groupie, but I have no ecology degrees. Like all of all my degrees are in the humanities and the social sciences, and I have an MFA, that's my terminal degree in creative nonfiction writing. And All of that is kind of a big mess when I throw it at you, but it's done some really important work for me. I sit in a zoology and physiology department now, which has perplexed our administrators for the whole time I've been on campus. But to me, it feels like I want to be in the environment where I'm working with the people that I'm working with, right? I don't I don't want to be siloed in the art space and I don't quite have the artist credentials and I haven't published enough books so I don't quite fit in the English literary creative writing corner of campus and what this whole meandering thing has done for me is is give me a lot of flexibility and an awareness of what the same kind of an idea does or doesn't mean in a lot of different settings so I've become a lot a lot more interested as I've sat in academia the last five or so years in thinking through how we can bring in these skills from a bunch of these different disciplines and help people help people be more effective at what we're trying to do, which is use science to make the world a better place. So I'm going to pop in the chat here if you want a slightly more coherent version of all of that. I have a career talk I did at ESA a couple of years ago recorded, you can check that out, especially if you're interested in the intersections of art, which I didn't talk that much about. But I agree with Mike, we should get this combo rolling. Well, thank you both. Um, Let's uh, switch. So thinking about ecological forecasting, uncertainty um, and quantifying uncertainty is a big part of creating and and communicating forecasts. And um, I know that both of you don't necessarily create forecasts or think about it that, uh, think about forecasts, um, but from your experiences, um, can you share how you've handled uncertainty or communicating uncertainty or any suggestions for that? And I do wanna let everyone know that we, um, last May, we hosted a seminar with Melissa Kenny, Michael Gerst, and Whitney Wolmer um, talking about the best practices of communicating uncertainty for forecasts, for ecological forecasts. And so I think Melissa will put that in the chat so people can go and, and see that. But it would be really good to have both of your perspectives, um, you know, to take a different uh, a look at thinking about communicating uncertainty. For me, I I think this is the it depends slash sort of 
hand wavy but true thing that I say for every kind of psychom advice, which is it depends so much on who you're trying to c- communicate with, who you're trying to engage. Um, the real basics are that we know that facts don't change people's minds, right? And so we usually need to start with some sort of relational something, some way that we share some interest in this issue. And that's, and that's why it's an, it depends thing. And I think, like, I just think about maybe relatives or, or friends back home who don't have quite the same connection to academic production of science and use of science knowledge. And, and I think it's easier actually to have some of these kinds of conversations, even though I may not see the world quite the same way that they do, because I know what matters to them, because I can really readily tap into what they care about. And so I would, I I think just as an example, climate change is a hot button topic in my family, (laughs) my very big family. And so are even things like evolution and just like a whole bunch of things that have to do with change, right? And and I think that the ways that I have most effectively connected back to some of some of the people that I know well about issues that we don't quite know how things are going to turn out is to very closely connect it to experiences where they basically made the same observation. You know, noticing that weather patterns are changing near Lincoln, Montana, way more snow some years, absolutely no snow other years. My uncle can't track, my aunt can't cross country ski because there isn't snow in an area that's usually buried. And just starting at least with something that we agree is a shared observation or a shared concern makes it a lot easier to get into some of the more technical stuff. And then a lot of times, I think it's about sustained interaction, which is also extremely hard The you know, the anyone who's working in academia or in a lot of these settings knows that we, all of our, all of our expectations and incentives go counter to building long-term relationships with individuals or communities or stakeholder groups. But it's not that I could just say, you know, it was a little tricky going skiing last year. So, and then rant about climate change. Like that's not a functional transition, right? Like I get to have that conversation with them over seven years worth of Thanksgiving dinners. And, and not everyone can build that kind of a relationship with a community or a stakeholder, but I do think we can keep some of those kinds of models in the back of our heads. And, and one thing I will say is that if you're in any position to change the system, and it's, it's a smaller level change, I think, than we really realize. Like, how do we evaluate people for tenure and promotion? Who do we hire? How do we review papers? Like, I think there are a lot, you know, what kind of permission do we give graduate students to connect to things in the world? These are small-ish things that we can do at, at any level of institutional power to hold the door open for this kind of work, to make space for some of these relationships to last over longer terms. and. There's, there's lots, there's lots more, but those are some thoughts to begin. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think um, one thing that um, I, that I guess when I started writing, one thing that always bothered me about like the environmental writing I had read or a lot of it was coming from a place where um, a voice where the author wasn't culpable. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like when you're talking about plastics or climate change, we're all culpable. And I think coming from that voice, like just acknowledging that up front, like I'm part of this problem too. I'm not just telling you to fix it is like really important. And it's it, and like I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to think about like um, the lessons I've learned and speaking a lot about plastics and, and science. And, and I often like whenever I give a talk about plastics or my book, like I always get people coming up to me afterward and asking about climate change because like I work in that space. Is it and like the question is always, is it real? Like it never goes much further than that. No one wants to know how many degrees, you know. Um, but like one of I guess I've thought about like a lot is like for me, it's like uh, the way I have it on a slide somewhere is like the words um candor, like audience concepts and then that's like wrapped in a bubble with commonality kind of around it and so like coming from this place of commonality like finding that with your audience and like acknowledging that you're part of whatever issue you're talking about too and like you're coming from a similar place I think is really important and then candor I think is a big part of uncertainty to just to to come at it from the, the idea of like 
we don't know exactly, but we know that something is something, right? And to just say that, and um, I, we just I just had a really good example of that with one of our um, postdocs on a or postdoc on our grant with a paper the other day. She had a comment in there when we were doing the final edits on a paper we were submitting, where she was saying like, you know, this part of the incubation is a little tricky to to claim this because you know the wetting and drying effects, the beginning of the soil incubation. Like, how should I should I include it? And I was like. You just say what you said right there in that comment like you can just acknowledge it like and move on and i think that like that idea of like candor and acknowledging it that we could apply there applies throughout science right and then i think audience like you touched on bethan is really important like do people want to know if it's real and exists or are you talking to someone who needs to know you know the, the percentage it's likely to occur are you talking to a land manager are you just talking to people and then another thing uh, what i what i'd be really curious to get your thoughts on is like one thing i've learned that I've slowly evolved to like in, in speaking to groups about plastic and stuff is like this idea of like concepts be, uh, and like giving people concepts. Because I feel like one thing that could happen, which I've always struggled with a little bit, is like you can go down this rabbit hole of like what ifs or what abouts, right? And you can't like address what e every what if, like if you're talking about the topic of plastic, like what if this, what if that, what about this, what about that? And so you don't like, and I feel like if you, that's like another kind of uncertainty where it's not like uncertainty of one idea or around one value or number, but it's like almost an uncertainty that comes from being overwhelmed and, and seeing like a million possibilities of like, what ifs and what abouts? And that's like a whole different type of uncertainty. So I feel like one thing I've gotten really into is this idea of like, how do I speak to an audience about a topic and not necessarily just give them a bunch of facts, but maybe start to build a framework to push onto them where they can then go forth and start to think about things almost from this like life, like a little more like life cycle analysis, critical thinking framework that they can use in the future without me being there to answer like what ifs or to find Google like every what if, you know? Um, I guess those are some thoughts I have. Um, and I also went to the University of Montana, so go Grizz. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you both. So the last question before we open it up to the Q&A, um, I think it goes along really nicely with what you've both been talking about is um, how to foster this two-way conversation. And before we were having the call, before I heard you talking, I was thinking about Mike's book, Beth Ann's podcast, and those both seem pretty one-way um, avenues for conversation. But I was thinking with Mike and his, um, as you've been talking to people and, and uh, meeting with audiences, and Beth Ann, I know with your podcast, you had collected questions from the community and then um, followed up on that. But I was wondering if you could just share any more about um, engaging in conversation and um, thinking more about those two-way conversations. Go for it, Mike, you're on mute. So I think, I mean, I think the the two way conversation thing is comes back a lot to me to this like idea of um, sort of the commonality thing, right? Like when you approach something from the um, perspective of like we, I'm not here and you're here, but we're both here. Like how do we? think about this. I, th I think it really changes everything, right? And I, I think, um, you know, I okay, so this is kind of a weird side story, but this is sort of um, uh, my, I have, like, I really like wrestling and boxing and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and I do them, like, every day. And so, like, um, I, when I would travel a lot for work and give book talks, I would always drop in at these, like, random gyms to wrestle or trick or box or whatever. It's just like something I've always done. And so, um, not the most liberal, scientific-minded crowd often, right? And so a lot of times people would be like, so why are you in town? And I'd be like, you know, in this little gym and I'd be like, oh, I'm here, you know, giving this talk. They'd be like, you know, and then a lot of times I'd end up getting into these like 25 minute discussions about climate science or something with like these groups of random people after like working out. And, you know, because we had shared this commonality and if it wasn't around there and we'd kind of just built this friendship, like we'd have these amazing discussions. And like, I felt like it was the most, oftentimes like the most, best job I've ever done of like communicating science. And so I think, you know, finding some connection like you talked about Beth Ann at the beginning and, and taking it a little bit slow and like building that is like how you have to come at this two-way conversation. And, and um, 
it's really important. Like I remember also like reading this, um, you know, it, reading this article about in researching my plastic book, it was titled like 10 things we wish had never been invented. And like the first one was plastic. And it's like, if you sit down and think about that for a second, it's like, we wouldn't be having the Zoom call. We wouldn't have pipettes. We probably wouldn't have vaccines. We'd all be laying in the dirt largely right now. <laughs> like, you know, like, like, and, and so that's just like ridiculous. Like, and so like, you know, I think it's really important to like, to like start off when I talk about plastic to like, I always spend some time acknowledging like why it's good. And I think the same thing we have to do from like this climate science side of like, let's all acknowledge that fossil fuels have played a role in getting us where we are and they're going to continue to play some role. But like, let's think about it from a different perspective of not like all or none, but like allocation and like, how do we make better choices around allocation so that we can preserve things that we want and, and tweak things to like have a better world overall. And I think coming at it from that perspective and like opening it to like this to not being like so hard lined is really important in like finding those commonalities and just acknowledging the need and like where we are. Like, I think that idea of like, we're all culpable, acknowledge it is really opens people up to not feeling like you're shaming them or guilting them. And like, then it's easier to talk around uncertainty in these topics of like, well, what does this look like? What could it look like? I, I guess that's a big part of it for me for the two-way conversation and opens it up. Absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm going to say some things that everybody is expecting coming, following on what Mike just said, but like, you know, I'm a, I'm a poor kid, but I'm a white lady, straight white lady. And I pass really well in more privileged spaces these days. And I think one of the hardest things is to remember that we each have our own frame of reference and that our communities that we operate most comfortably in have a frame of reference and it's not necessarily a shared frame of reference like I make this mistake going home sometimes when I got really obsessed with local food system stuff in college I came home and like couldn't eat anything at Thanksgiving dinner and I got a real talking to from my mom and I deserved it right like food's a gift it's not a thing to judge every GD day like I can make my choices in a grocery store not at my grandma's table and and, and I needed that reminding. And I think I need it on an ongoing basis. I think a lot of us probably need that reminder because we're the only one who has our life experience, right? And everyone else, we're kind of watching them have their life experience, but it's not the same. And, and there's a lot of behavioral psychology that is really helpful, has been super helpful for me in the last couple of years about thinking about... Um, like the Dalai Lama has this whole angle in the Art of Happiness book about self-inflicted suffering, which is a broader concept in Buddhism. And I am not a Buddhist by any means, but it, it helps me a lot in trying to connect with people or trying to help scientists or science students around me connect with people. And that is that like deeply resenting people who do something or live differently than you is just causing yourself suffering, right? Like we all there are very few of us in the world that are going around on purpose to be a bad guy, right? And, and it's just really easy to forget that. And so I think a, as, as regular reminders as I can get into my life and as I can share with students when I'm teaching classes, like we're all, we're all doing what we think is good work in the world, most of us, right? And, and yeah, we need calling in and sometimes we need calling out. And a lot of times I think we need that common ground and someone to believe that we can change and do better, right? Like I'm where I came from, nobody would believe that I would wind up thinking about or caring about or voting the way I do now. And, and I have to believe that I'm not a unicorn. I have to believe that, or why would I go to work every day? Because I think that the work that I do helps other people believe that change is possible on an individual and a community community and bigger levels than that. And uh, I think I think another element, and Mike, you were pointing at it when you were like, you know, here I am with all my knowledge, right? Like I've been a book nerd my whole life and I've, and I remember a lot of what I read and, and I can be a really annoying person to talk to sometimes as a result, <laughs> because I'm like hitting you with all these ideas and information and, and, and even, even other widely read people, like you can fatigue them with your expertise, right? And I think it can be important to remember not to weaponize expertise, just like we don't want to weaponize identity and, and other types of 
of things. So I'm not really getting to the common ground thing on a very direct level, Jody. sorry. But I, I do think that that for me, a lot of it is trying to remember where I'm situated and then to, to take massive advantage of the privilege I do have to change things, right? Not just to benefit myself, but to like, I'm a white lady and, and I'm an arty person in a science space. So people expect me to say strange things. So I say them, you know, like thinking about the kind of space you can hold from whatever your position or identity or knowledge base is, but but being able to calibrate that in the right environments. So you're not pulling that kind of thing on people in a library. <laughs> I, I think you touched on something really important there, Beth, which is like the idea of, of like continuing, like you said, I think you said weaponizing, which is really funny, but like the idea of like, if you make a little, if you, you know, have that conversation and, and you, you see someone kind of go like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, maybe that's a good place to stop. Because people uh, just like having them go, oh, and then like stopping and like transitioning to talking about something else. But then the, like maybe they'll go figure it out a little more on their own or next time you talk. Like you don't have to do it all at once, like is I think is really important, you know, and it's like this idea of like it, you don't need to beat people over the head with something. <laughs> guess, and I'm I'm yeah. bad at that. Right. Like I grew up in a in a church tradition where sermons like you say the same <laughs> thing multiple times right in a row. And I totally have that rhetorical tick in my own speaking. Mike, what you're saying, I'm Melissa, you may remember this. It was either Melissa or Emily Cloyd from AAAS was a guest in my class last spring. Well, they both were one of the two of them said this thing that like rocked my whole class and it became a center point of our conversations for the whole rest of the semester. And that was exactly what you said, Mike, that you are an incremental part of someone's journey of knowledge and experience in the world and, and realization of what can or needs to change. And I think it's important permission for ourselves as well as like an important sort of caution that we're probably not going to completely overhaul someone else's way of knowing or being in the world through one conversation or even a semester long course. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I also think another part of it is like, if you're on, if you're like, if you're this far into science, like the, like, I guess, even at this point, like everyone who's on this call, like the way, like the whole, like, I, get, I don't know how to say this, but like, Science is hypercritical, right? Right. We've all experienced like a hypercritical environment where like we've been taught like almost in graduate school to be or at like conferences to be so fearful of what we might say and the response and what we might write to like this, you know, and like oftentimes it's just over the top, I feel like a lot of the times where in most of the world, like you can speak much more freely, like we don't you don't have to be so cautious in what you say. And like people speak more loosely and more freely than we do and when we write in science topics or we give a talk at a conference. And so like I, th I think it's just good to like to be to like remember you can like open up and speak more freely and like people aren't like hanging on every little nuance to the same degree that we do in science and like looking for like chinks in it you know what I mean <laughs> like I think and even you, if they are like that's and if they are that's fine and like yeah but I, I think there's a lot of times like that's not the case as much when you're with a, an audience and like public um where you can be where it's like you can you have that freedom and that's what makes it nice and what I don't know I've always enjoyed that a lot mm -hmm. all right well I'm gonna bring in Melissa and um we'll get to the Q&A but I just want to say this has been great just to think about um because as you were especially talking about this this last part about the relationship building and fostering two-way communications and it's so much different than academic publications and so um, you know part of ecological forecasting is sharing the forecasts and communicating with the public and so um, thinking outside of ways um, not just thinking the way that we communicate in publications but developing these relationships and fostering communications is great so Melissa I think I'll let you take yeah. it away for the Q&A yeah, no, th thank you so, so much, Beth Ann and, and Mike. It's so great to have your thoughts and perspective. And um, there's a lot of questions that are coming in. I really appreciate everyone being so inquisitive. And if you have other questions, just note in the chat, there is a link um, so that you can, you can share those. But the first question I wanna ask 
is I want you to share a psychom horror story, a time when you got something really wrong that made you rethink your approach. I, I don't, I don't, I think for me, it was like, um, I mentioned earlier, like this idea of like concepts. Um, and the, one of the first times like I gave a talk about my book to like a, it was like a, it was a like a garden club in Portland, Oregon or something. Um, like, and like there's like 60 or 70 people. And it, it, it was before I really had this like idea of like giving a talk about this topic. And like, it just went down this rabbit hole of like, what if, what about like, what if I have this type of plastic? What about this Tupperware? Can I put a piece of chicken in it? Can I wash this in the dishwasher? And it's like for like an hour, you know? And it was like, oh my God, like that was where, uh, and like, I didn't feel like I taught anyone anything. You know what I mean? Cause like I, and that was like, uh, that was when I was like, there's like, I have to think better of like, and my, the book like was structured very much conceptually and about history and like how we got here and like why we're here. But like, I hadn't figured out how to like, in like, you know, 35, 40 minutes, like, convey that in a way to like give people framework and that was where I had to sit back and stop and think like well this isn't helpful like what can I do to like really like teach like how do we how do you actually provide a message and like what can I provide a message in that amount of time that's useful and so I think that was a big one for me where I really sat down, back down and thought like I have to restructure like really how I talk about this in person to people like how do I provide like a message so I can send people off and, and like say to them, like at the beginning, like I can't give you like every what if we can't go down, we can talk about every different kind of toilet paper today and have if it has plastic in it or like, you know, for, for six straight hours, but that's not getting anyone anywhere. So like, how do we, like, how do I do that? And I had to like really rethink uh, my communication strategy. And that was a big moment for me where I was like, okay, so like, how do I do that? How do I give people a concept um, that is useful and teach a concept? So that was, I think mine. I have, a, I have a couple of levels to this. And one of them is just like my ongoing fear that I'm like just barely equipping people and making it actually more dangerous, you know, like just enough rope to get yourself in trouble. And, and there's no, there's no control that anyone can have over that. Right. I teach semester long courses. I coach a lot of scientists. There's only so much, and then they're going to go do things in the world. And I have to just believe that it's going to go like we all intend it to and so I think it's a not so much a horror story but this sort of abiding anxiety that like but maybe we should have talked about one more paper or like what if I had remembered and shown that other class the plain language calculators you know like there's just there's always one more thing that could have been done and like, there is no magic tool right and I just have to remember that and then I think for me the other part of it is walking away from conversations, feeling like a little bit like you, Mike, like I wasn't ready for it. And I didn't say the most effective thing. And I think where that most gets me is with people that I'm much closer to. It's either an affinity group that I'm in, you know, some community activity that I do, or, or, you know, back when I did a lot of outdoor education, like answering someone's question, but not in a way that was like, you can just feel you didn't, get them where they wanted to be with an answer from you. Yeah. And, and I think, I think that especially continues to happen with my family. And then honestly, I think the horror stories are when somebody asks you the question, you're like, oh crap, could you have asked me any question but that? Like one time <laughs> my husband and I were butchering uh, a mule deer. We, we hunt pretty actively. It's one of the holdovers for my local food obsession. And my mom was helping us and my family didn't hunt. I had uncles who taught me to hunt when I was an adult, but point being like, this is a circumstance that's already uncommon to be in with my mom because it wasn't a habitual thing. And then she just turns to my husband and I don't think we were even married yet at that point. So the stakes are high. And, and she says, so can you explain evolution to me? I mean, like, how did people come from monkeys? And like, you, you have to understand, like the, I come from a Calvinist background, the closest that is mainstream is some kind of Baptist. Like this is a really intense question to get asked from somebody who has that kind of framework. 
and it's just like, <gasps> it's like, what's he going to say? He's not always super quick on his feet. Like he doesn't teach this stuff. Oh my word. And so for me, a lot of times the horror stories are like the moment the question gets asked and like the frantic running in my head to be like, how are we going to talk about this? How are we going to keep everybody still talking to each other? Like we still have pumpkin pie to eat, you know, like, like the, it's, it's the like group activity leader part of me that goes into overdrive. And it's not that it necessarily goes poorly, but I can imagine how poorly it could go. That's the horror for me. <laughs> I really, I appreciate that response because I, I think the horror aspect is always like how you feel and how you feel it's been impacted and potentially some of the like fallout from it. But, but really, you know, when we think about science communication, it's all about someone else and their values and what they want to know and what they're bringing to the table and the context and information that, that they care about, which um, sort of leads me into mm -hmm. the next question, because it's really exciting that both of you have these really diverse sets of science communication skills, including using art for storytelling. And I wanted you to to see if you would share a little bit about how you use these different kinds of science communication approaches and when you pull out different tools to reach different groups of people. And, and if you had any advice on what works, what works best when you're trying to communicate um, to either different groups of people or, or different kinds of messages. Mike, you want to start? Sure. I, I, so I think, um, Oops, maybe uh, no, I'm not gonna do it. Okay, um, I think um, I think you need. I, I guess I think of um, like the different art forms and the different tools as like two different things. Like you need like a hook to get people in. Um, and for me, like I think um, like I, I find you know when I give talks, um, I find like powerful images. I find photography, mine or other people's, to be really a really good like way to get people in. Like they're like the talk I typically give on plastic um, has like, a, has images, but not that many, but they're ones that I find like really powerful, whether I've taken them or someone else has. And I find that you can like find images that can represent like a, something, you know, a whole topic and then talk around that image. And I think that's really powerful for me. And I think people like that. And then I, I, I also think like, and this just is kind of my personality. Like I um, think that um, like, humor is also really powerful in keeping audiences engaged and like a little self-deprecation leads to like comes to that like idea of like we're all in this together and like culpable and like telling like I use like linking personal stories a little bit like personal failures like I th feel are very you know helpful and and um in communicating around this plastic topic like um stuff like that like a lot you know and like I find that good and like it also it, it brings you into the into part of it like uh, that's a big thing for me I, I think that might be my biggest thing and like this communication is like is like you're we're all in it together I'm part of it and like showing myself as being part of this and I'm struggling too like how do I do it like it's not like I'm sitting here like if only you would do something climate change would be fixed you know like the heck, <laughs> you know like and, and like making people feel like we're all in this group together and we're all like oh like how do we solve this um and so I, those are the tools that I really like like I like the, the idea of images they're simple they can be powerful um it can convey a lot and then like the, like the idea of humor um I feel like um I don't know yeah that like I think the onion is like the second best newspaper in America I stand by that statement <laughs> and like they do a really good job of like holding a mirror to society of humor like I love that like I think it's powerful and you could do some of that in your talks is really good too so that's sort of some of my some of my thought yes and <laughs> I think for for me part of it also is that there's so many people in the world that used to draw or want to draw or just are really kind of caught and taken by things that were obviously made by a person's hands. And, and maybe, I, you know, I'm sure there's whole real realms of academic discourse around this, but maybe it's because we do so much digitally these days that things that have been made by hand I don't know, maybe it's just nostalgia. Maybe nobody really wants to be making their own pottery anymore, but we think we do because we don't make much by our own two hands, at least 
a lot of academic environment -y type people. But for me, I've been doing this for long enough that it was kind of pre the ubiquity of everything digital and and still people were really drawn to a very particular kind of art that I made. Photorealistic, very precise illustrations. Yes. Wow. That's amazing. I could never do that. But my like splashy, loose color outside the lines, field sketches, watercolor illustrations, people get grabbed by those in a very different sort of way. And I think it's because you know a person made it, right? Like that didn't get made on a computer until very recently, that wasn't possible. Now people are so good at digital painting that you could make it look like that. But I, so I think that there's something going on in the way a lot of people's aesthetics register that just gets grabbed by really good visuals. And I think for me, my experience has been in particular when those visuals look at all handmade. And then I think I can also hook people in a particular way because I say, but you can do this. And I have a whole, a whole course of like a cup. I can do this in multiple workshops or we can do a, a crash course boot camp in an hour. And at the end of it, you do know how to draw. You do know how to start to draw something you're looking at. Like you know where to begin. You, you know the psychology that's getting in your way and the human history that gives you total permission because you're a human too. And, and so I think for me, part of it is if we can give people permission to imagine that they can learn a skill like drawing, what else can we learn? What else is possible? What else kind of mindsets can change? And, and so for me, you know, I, I like still doing illustrations on the side for projects with collaborators or things like that. But for me, mostly art now is a mind shift tool. And, and I have some really nerdy training programs I got to develop with our local art museum where we just make scientists really uncomfortable in an art museum for about a half a day or a day. And it's just wonderful. Well, I love that not being someone who has any artistic ability, I would love to see if I could just even do some, some things that are simple, but I, I do have to say like, you know, um, Michael, I know you use photography and, and Beth Ann, the illustrations you've done have really been impactful when I've given public engagement talks because she did her work for a paper that we wrote and we then use that as we uh, were sharing that message out to a wide range of audiences. And it's just a, it's a visual reminder, like a, a visual bookmark of some of the key points that you're you're trying to make that just make it a little bit more impactful. So we only have time for one more question. And so I'm going to ask you, what's the one piece of advice you have for students or early career scientists who want to start exploring SciComm? I can keep this short, I think. Uh, it's cross-train. It might not surprise you. I've talked about pretty much every discipline we can imagine in the last hour. You don't know what you're going to need to know later. And what you do know is that everyone around you is going to make sure you know science really well. But few people around you, because academics are trained to be academics, are going to know very much about conflict mediation or running meetings effectively or even designing an agenda that gives people a clue how long a thing is going to take, let alone stuff like maybe you do want to get better at images. So take a graphic design class or an illustration class. Maybe you want to be a more eloquent writer. Take some literature or creative writing classes. That's the corner of campus where they teach you how to read and write brilliantly. You want to know how things intersect with social issues, American studies, culture and gender, disability studies, like go to the corners of campus where people know how to do the things that you want science to do. Because in my experience coming into academia, most of what I can help people with in science is because science doesn't know how to teach people how to do this stuff. So go do it. Go find the things that you love and get somebody to teach you how to do them better. Yep. I would, I would echo that sentiment. I would say that, that I mean, that exactly. But then I think that, and like, just trying it, don't be scared to try it. Just give it a shot and you might fall on your face some, and that's fine. You'll learn. And if you, and if that's a great way to learn and keep moving forward. So 
just trying it and look and and even I would add look outside of that like the academic setting altogether look completely to other places where people communicate well like you want to hear someone who can tell a story really well listen to like baseball games on the radio like those announcers are amazing like I don't know like you know what I mean like there's all sorts of people who are really great storytellers and convey information in really fascinating ways so like don't be as scared to look broad and draw influences from like all over. Yeah, that's, that's my take. Thank you both. Jody. I'll turn things back to you. Yes, just like Alyssa said, thank you so much for both of you uh, for joining us and for sharing your time with us and insights. And thank you to everyone that has joined the call. It's been great um, to have you all here and look for our future uh, seminars coming up. We'll keep posting them on Twitter and Ecolog and Effie Slack and uh, reach out to us at any time. So thank you all. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Bye. everyone.